Hello and welcome to this video. This video is going to be called What is Really Wrong with Contemporary Jazz? Right? Um, recently, I um, put a video out on my channel, quite innocently. I didn't think anyone would really look at it, to be honest. And it was uh, um, an answer to a question that a viewer of my channel had put in the comments. And they'd said, can you tell me why all modern jazz sounds the same? And that chimed with me, and it, I think it chimes with a lot of other people, doesn't it? Um, so I put the video out, and it really attracted a lot of interest. A lot of people that really agreed, and a lot of people that didn't agree. And I followed that up with an, a lot of other videos, trying to explore this idea more. Um, but I was really troubled by this. Now, there is definitely something out there that people feel is not quite right with modern jazz, right? That it doesn't have the innovatory, exciting, um, uh, uh, and dangerous aspect that uh, jazz used to have. It's become very corporate, it's very, uh, you know, a product of educated, well-off jazz students that can afford to go to colleges and get them um, you know, a good training in, in jazz and they, they know all the notes and all the right things to play. And although that could be stunning to listen to from a technical point of view, we don't quite get that feeling of pushing boundaries. Now, this idea actually does trouble me. And throughout all the um, process of making these videos, I was troubled with a contradiction because I don't think every musician has to be innovative. And I don't think that great music has to be made by people that are innovating. I think that you can make great music um, which is within a genre and it can really entertain people and blow them away. So that's not quite the issue, right? Um, I don't think musicians have to have a completely individual sound. Most of us, well, I think all of us are a product of our influences and we pull those together. So the fact that musicians today sound like, you know, musicians in the past, obviously at the beginning of jazz, influences are, are, are much more, um, they're more, much less apparent in a way, you know, people in the old days didn't listen to as much stuff. They might have listened to one or two musicians and it been able to go on their own path, but we have the whole history of jazz behind us. So of course that's gonna have a greater effect. So all these things, these, these would have been the arguments that I would have countered myself with. And of course, I could just be looking back at jazz history with, through rose-tinted spectacles from the view of a boomer stroke Gen X, whichever one I am, because I think I'm on the cusp, you see, um, that, um, you know, when I was young and my mind was open, everything seemed wonderful and new, and now I'm old and heard everything, it all seems boring and old, you know, and that's just a standard thing, and it's like, a, it's an illusion. And, uh, you know, not young people coming out and listening to jazz are excited by it because the first time they've heard it, you know. So, so um, I think that those are all reasonable um, counter arguments to what I was saying. So I was troubled by this. Now, recently I uh, shot a, vi a video where I explained my love of one of my favorite guitarists on the planet, and that is Scott Henderson. And I went through some of my favorite albums and um, I was very pleased to find out that Scott watched the video and he liked what I'd said. I think he appreciated it, but I, he questioned um, me on his latest, latest two releases. He said, have you got the latest two albums? And I was like, no. And he said, well, I'll send you a copy. So Scott sent me a copy of his last two albums out over and I've been listening to them all week. And in um, originally this video was going to be a review of those two albums um, and it is but listening to those albums Scott Henderson sort of solved what my fundamental issue is with contemporary jazz when I listen to these albums and I'm going to try and explain it on this video but first let's let's do a little bit of a review so the albums he sent me over was from 2015 Vibe Station and then he followed that up more recently with People Mover, okay? Um, I popped these albums on in the car and what I was struck with, or struck by, was the fact that the uh, guitar playing and the compositions were so fully realized. 
Um, I know what Scott Henderson is about and I'm going to try and get into it on this video but what he's about for me he has really consolidated on these albums. They are true fusion albums. He's been able to take all the elements that makes him who he is and he's been able to forge those in terms of his guitar playing into a unique individual sound. You could hear the influences. You know, it would be very easy to say, well, you know, he, he's like a cross between Jeff Beck, but Jeff Beck with um, bebop and jazz vocabulary. It'd be very easy to describe him like that. You know, it'd be very easy to say, this is a guy that can play jazz, but brings blues influences in. You could say all that, but it, when you hear Scott Henderson, as soon as he plays the notes, you know it's Scott Henderson, and you really feel it on these albums. In terms of his compositions, Scott Henderson is, is really balancing a whole point, a whole um, catalogue of disparate influences, right? Now, there's one thing just to put it all in the pot and chuck it all in, but the real master can actually write compositions which pull these two things together and actually get them to work together um, harmonically, and I don't mean as in, in chords and notes, I mean as in all the elements are, are working for each other. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And in a sense, that truly is what fusion is. And jazz essentially can be seen as fusion right from the beginning. It's, it's a way of bringing in different elements, all right? So I'm driving around, I got this on in the car all week and I'm listening to it and I'm really enjoying it. They're fantastic albums, right? Um, they are some of the best of Scott's career and I think if you just wanted two albums to um, really show what Scott Henson's about, these are the two albums, you know. So um, if you're a jazz fusion fan, if you're a jazz fan, if you're a guitar fan, if you're a rock fan, if you're a blues fan, if you're a prog fan, go and get a copy of these albums now. They are very great albums and they really triggered a thought process in my mind that I'm going to now go into that now. So what is it about these albums that made me solve the problem and got me to the, 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 the crux, the kernel, the heart of what I think is the problem with modern jazz and it's down to the influences, okay? Scott Henderson is a true jazz musician all those jazz snobs out there that would look down their noses at somebody who can't play the notes and doesn't know the language and hasn't, you know, woodshedded and paid their dues, you know, and would pick on certain people claiming access to the jazz world, but going, well, they, you know, they're not really doing it properly. Nobody can say that about Scott Henderson. He has the jazz vocabulary down, right? He really understands what jazz is, right? But there's a whole ton of other influences in there as well, right? We know this. Now, is it the fact that there's a whole ton of influences that make me think that's the thing that's lacking from modern jazz? No, it's not that at all, right? Is it the compositions being so strong and so self-realized? Well, I think there's something in there that needs to be mentioned. Is it the fact that Scott Henderson does have a signature sound? Sort of, right? He sort of is, that's what it is. But when I was driving around, listening to these albums, one of the things that struck me is Scott Henderson is an out-and-out -out jazz musician. These aren't jazz rock albums. These are jazz albums, right? But how much would the jazz world actually let this in? How much would the gatekeepers open their arms and go, here is one of the great jazz albums of the contemporary scene? They will review it. They will mention it. But musicians like Scott Henderson actually get sidelined, okay? Musicians like Scott Henderson, like Alan Holdsworth, like Sean Lane, a whole truckload of these musicians that are really incredible and um, groundbreaking have to exist in this nether world because they don't get the support of the mainstream jazz world, right? And the reason is, is because the mainstream jazz world, when they hear this, it doesn't quite smell like jazz to them, okay? Now, why is that? Now, what it is, as I said, Scott Henderson is an out-and-out -out jazz musician. But the difference between Scott and a lot of modern jazz musicians is he takes um, and is affected by and influenced by 
all the music that has existed right up to now. He is not gatekeeping the influences on himself, right? He is not seeing himself as a jazz musician that has to pull certain cliches from the jazz world. So to put this simply, if you've clicked on this video because you want to think what I think is really wrong with contemporary jazz, what is really wrong with contemporary jazz? It is no longer being influenced by music that happened after 1970 or maybe even before. Now there are musicians out there that will grudgingly put a sort of jazz rock funky beat in them or a few hip hop stuff and all that type of thing. Now they, they'll let it in a little bit, they'll nod to it, but you could only do it so far. If you do it too much, the jazz world will turn around and go, hang on, this smells funny. You know, Frank Zappa was right. You know, jazz does smell funny and I tell you who thinks that the most is the jazz snob gatekeepers, right? They're not quite up with this. It's, it's not me being the Gen X boomer. It's the jazz world. The jazz world itself is old. The jazz world itself is stuck in its vision of what jazz is. Now, this is not just a thing that has occurred in jazz organically. There was a change in jazz. There was a change in jazz history in the 1980s. Right? At that point, there was a revisionist historical, politically driven view that came into what jazz is, right? This really also centered around race, um, the idea of jazz being a, um, a, a, an Afro-American black art form, which in some way was voicing the struggles of the black community in America. This became the overarching narrative. Musicians like Winter Masalis really pushed this idea and, and really saw a lot of the things that happened to jazz that had happened in the 70s as being sort of wrong, okay? As jazz became, became more conservative, music college, which, which before had been very sniffy to jazz, right? I can remember in the 1980s, um, in the UK, there was one jazz course at degree level. It was at the Guildhall. That was it. If you were a musician, you wanted to study music, you went and did classical music. If you're a rock musician, forget it. We have, now have um, music colleges that are teaching jazz and we have music colleges teaching rock. And I've done that job. I've taught jazz and I've taught rock in colleges, right? So I know how that works, right? So when um, that conservative view came in and then jazz education emerged and they went to the guys that were around and took the sort of zeitgeist that was out there it there there emerged that conservative idea of what jazz is of it really being rooted in bebop and post bebop ideas and vocabulary that goes into the music colleges and that becomes the way that you play jazz now scott henderson is a brilliant example of someone who has gone through that all right and there's no problem with that. I have no problem. It's a, it, it's a great thing to do if you're a musician. Do that stuff because it's great. You really understand how music works. It's a difficult thing to get your head around. And, it, and it's, it's a lifetime study. And nobody should be put down for having that influence in their music. Right? But when you listen to Scott Henderson and you listen to these albums, artistically, it's as though he is doing the moral thing, the thing that he's right to do, which is to open your arms to all music from all eras and let it come in without the filter up, right? Scott Henderson on here plays from the bebop language. He plays from the modal jazz language. He pulls in ele elements from world music and he, and he looks into that sort of influence on Indian music as it goes into sort of jazz in the 60s. He's got that in there. He's got classic rock influences like Jeff Beck, and uh, Richie Blackmore, he's got heavy metal influences in there. And the blues, right? And this is the thing that really struck me, all right? Jazz and blues holds hands, all right? You can't take one away from the other, all right? That's the bottom line. It's like, I think John McGoughlin once said, you know, if you take the blues out of jazz, there's no jazz left. Musicians had in the old days, a very expressive uh, voice. It was a combination of jazz vocabulary and a sense of what the blues is. In music colleges today, in jazz music colleges, how much are they teaching the blues? And if they do teach the blues, has it become a, 
uh, did it become about pentatonic scales and blue notes and why they work? Do they teach the sound, the meaning of the blues, the expression that is in one note? Okay? And can you even teach that? Um, all the way throughout these albums, the overriding influence on these albums, all the way through is the blues. Scott Henderson, Scott Henderson has a real affinity with the blues. And I feel that ethically, he doesn't feel it's right to just sit there and churn out blues recordings, you know, shuffles and 12 bars, but it's in there. And it's the same thing with the jazz. You know, he's not gonna just sit there and play in a stream of 16th notes through the changes. You know, that's, that's not right. It's not artistically right. You have to take your influences, all your influences that make you who you are. And if you're a musician working in the world today, it, it goes without saying that you should be influenced by what is going on around you. And to gatekeep that and go, well, I can't bring that in. I can't bring that in. If I bring that in and that in, then will I get classed as jazz? Is this jazz? Do, you know, how much can I remove? How much can I add? How, you know, and um, that thing on these albums that I can hear is then realized within his compositions. These compositions are not head, solo, head. They're not. These compositions are convoluted and they take you places and they, they set up expectations and then they dash those expectations. They take you on a journey. Scott Henderson uses improvisation as a compositional structural element within the tunes. There's all sorts of different improvisation which are pulled from all the different styles of music. You know, at some point he will go towards the blues and just as you accept that he's just screaming the blues, elements start to creep in and show you that the blues is actually something else and these notes might make you feel this sort of Phrygian dominant, you know, minor second sound which takes you into sort of, uh, you know, North Africa. You hear, you hear the roots of music, the history of music in these compositions. Now, where's Scott Anderson got that? Well, the overriding uh, influence in terms of composition to my ears is Joe Zawinul. And Joe Zawinul is a brilliant musician of being able to take the contemporary scene of his time, which was electronic music, um, synthesizers, multi-tracking, all those sounds, fuse that with jazz, but also with a sort of European folk form sound. He, his, his music sounds like a pr procession. It sounds like people are walking through uh, a, a village square and they're, they're enjoying themselves. It's a fiesta sometimes with Joe Zawinul. The very simple, the very simple ideas meshed with the very complex ideas. Now, that might sound like, yeah, that's a good thing to do, but it's hard to do. And Zavanel had to create a language. And the thing that made Weather Report not sound like Coltrane or sound like Ornette Coleman or sound like Bud Powell, the reason Weather Report are completely different and us boomer stroke Gen X people can hear that and go, well, look at Weather Report. They were just so different to all the music that went 10 years before, but they were a product of that. How would did guys like Wayne Shorter and Joe Zavanel travel that distance? And now I'm listening to guys, they're great, they're great, but I put it on and really, except for maybe a few hip hop flourishes in here and there, that music could be, could have been made 40 years ago. That's the thing and it's, all well and good to say that, but it comes through the compositions. It comes through being able to understand that and be able to compose within that. Now, I put the album on and I can hear the Zawinul influence very strong, but behind that there's another influence and I'm gonna take a risk, because I know Scott Henderson will watch this and he'll either go, no, no, Andy's got it completely wrong, but I'm gonna go, stick my neck out. I can hear a strong influence from Herbie Hancock's compositions as well on this these albums. And Herbie Hancock, um, I think his composition, and Wayne Shorter as well, there's another guy, but I, I class Wayne Shorter to that influence. And so there's certain points where I was thinking, God, this really does sound like Zabinal. No, it doesn't. It sounds like Weather Report. It sounds like Wayne Shorter, right? Uh, but I can hit Herbie Hancock would make sort of, certain, like speak like a child. It's definitely not head, solo head. This, this opens up and it takes you through this sort of journey in which the improvisation is acting in a certain way. It's very hard to describe. I hear that influence. Um, with the Zawinul and Shorter influences, I can hear the influence in the chord changes. I can hear them in the way the, the chords are constructed. I can hear them in the melodies. 
But I think that Herbie Hancock influence, the organisational aspect of Herbie's compositions, I think that that's in there as well. So as I get to the end of this video, I hope I've sold the albums to you. Obviously, I think they're great, and I hope I've done a, a, a different but good review, and I hope Scott appreciates what I've done. But to put it simply, what I think is wrong with contemporary jazz, um, what is really wrong with contemporary jazz, is to do with the aspect of fusion and the way fusion and the, is, is the, not the mixture of jazz and rock, it's the assimilation of the influences that make you who you are, the influences that are all around you on every level. And that has to be channeled through a compositional approach. Now my daughter's just, have you brought me an ice cream? Yeah. Can I have it then please? You, don't yeah. come over the other side of the camera though because you'll be in the YouTube video. Just pass it here. Wait, um... Just get, I mean, this is going to go on YouTube. It has a sweet inside of it. Oh lovely, you don't want me to choke on it. Thank you Hattie, that's very lovely. So, my daughter has just brought me a lovely ice cream to finish this video with. Here it is. And so, um, I'd like to say to Scott Henderson, cheers for the album. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, like it. If you want to see more videos, then uh, subscribe and ring the notification bell. And you really do need to do this in this modern world of YouTube. The algorithms change. And if you don't press that, they won't necessarily be putting my videos up your nose. And also, if you want to support me, become a Patreon. Look at the, look at the structural quality of this uh, ice cream. So I'm going to finish up there. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you on the next video. Mmm. Mmm. What the hell? Mmm. Don't speak. Don't speak at it. Because you'll be on the video. This is going to go out. Thousands of people will see this all over the world. Yeah, just being a little weirder. They know I'm weird, Hattie. They know it. They've seen enough videos to know what I'm like. And they, you know, there's some people, Hattie, that are still watching this. They're just sitting watching me eating the ice cream. Mmm. Mmm. It was tasty, this is. It's actually. Oh, lovely. See ya, bye.